I'm going to introduce our speaker for our session today, which is Amphibians of Georgia Piedmont. We are so happy to welcome Mark Mandika, who is the co-founder and executive director of the Amphibian Foundation. Uh, he lectures in amphibian and reptile biology at Agnes Scott College. He received his Bachelor's of Science from UMass, where his thesis focused on the ephemeral wetland ecology of the amphibians. He then went on to the American Museum of Natural History in New York, where he worked as a curatorial assistant. I've been practicing that word. Okay, great. <laughs> curatorial assistant before moving to South Florida to graduate school at University of Miami. Mark's master's explored the amphibian community ecology in the Everglades, as well as photoreception related activity patterns in South Florida. Buffonid. Correct me. Buffonid. Oh. Bufonids. Bufonids. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, Mark. Um, he does That's prior okay. He prioritizes inclusivity in his conservation work as a vital component of creating lasting solutions to the global amphibian extinction crisis. He serves as the outreach and education lead for the diversity, equity, and inclusion task team for PARC, as well as on the same steering committee. Um, through his work with the Amphibian Foundation, they partnered with the federal program diversity joint venture for conservation careers and established a justice equity diversity and inclusion program and fund that offers training programs and scholarship awards aimed at increasing inclusion for underrepresented groups in conservation. Mark is also a professional scientific illustrator and is published in textbooks as well as the journal Science, Nature, Journal of Experimental Biology, Zoology, American Zoology, and many others. So we're so happy to have you here today, Mark, um, and I'll let you take it away. Okay, thank you, Bailey uh, and Cecilia. Can you all hear me okay? Yeah, okay, good. Um, <clears throat> thank you for that introduction, and it's my pleasure to be here at the Confluence to talk about amphibians. Um, I've had the pleasure of of speaking at the confluence about amphibians and occasionally reptiles as well for a number of years and it's a highlight of ours and um it's a little peculiar to be doing it from uh, my basement this year but this is how it is um anyway i have a lot to cover i wanted to talk with you all about amphibian amphibian monitoring community science conservation all of these good things um, and, you know, I've always been extremely passionate about amphibians. Um, you know, my career has been very laser focused on amphibians, but it's uh, transitioned over the years from uh, straight experimental biology to more of a conservation focus. Um, four years ago, we founded the Amphibian Foundation here in Atlanta, and that's basically when we just took the full leap 100% conservation. And I'm gonna go into some of the reasons for that, but you know, amphibians are in trouble and, and they're disappearing. Um, and so what I'm gonna be talking with you about today is mostly our efforts here in the Piedmont and Metro Atlanta uh, to monitor amphibians. So I'm gonna share my screen uh, and I welcome any questions, of course, uh, I'd love to have this as conversational as we can through Zoom and the chat box, but I'm going to uh, share my screen now, if I can. Yes, I can. Thank you. So um, the first thing I wanted to show everybody is that just in case you are unaware, we have this website, uh, MAMP, M-A-A-M-P dot U-S. And this, if you're interested, is a resource for our uh, community science program. And it is highlights all 28 species of amphibians in the Georgia Piedmont. So if you have a question or you wanted to try to ID anything, you can come to this site and you can actually click on the season you're interested in, uh, spring, for example, and it'll highlight the uh, amphibian species that are, are typically breeding at this time of year. Uh, and you can go through, um, you can also, uh, isolate them by um, wetland type. So it's this is the same list, the same 28 species, but if you wanted to list them by stream, for example, you're in a stream, you wanna see which species are likely to occur there. So it's a handy resource. 
each species has its own page where you can play or download the call if it's a calling species. Uh, it has as many pictures as we could find of the different uh, life stages like egg, larvae, juvenile, adult. Um, just a real nerd fest on Atlanta amphibians if you're interested in that. So I just wanted to point that out um, as we get going. Okay. Uh, Mark, can we also see your calendar? Uh, the calendar. Um, and see the question, um, which calendar do you mean? The Oh, sorry, Mark. I was just, when you were sharing your screen, we saw the, the website kind of on the left. We also saw your calendar and other things on the right. Oh, no. Okay. So it's That's okay. Terrible. I just, <laughs> it's okay. fine. We still got to right. see it. You still got to see it there. That's what we're showing. That is that better? Yes. Okay. I apologize for that. I thought I was just sharing this. Um, but here, this is just uh, everything I just said, but here is the, the website. Sorry about that. Thank you, Bailey. All right, now I'm going to attempt to share uh, just the presentation. Um, let's see, how's, how's that? Is that good or is, am yes. I showing all sorts of stuff? Okay, <laughs> thank you. Okay, um, thank you. So, um, so here I put some slides together, um, some pictures and some calls. Actually, I better check to make sure I am. I've had trouble because I'm going to be sharing some sound. So I'm going to try this again. Yes, you got to click the share sound um, just in case. OK, one more try. Still good? Still good. Your video is anymore, but that's fine as long as you're fine with that. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. All right. So, as I mentioned, uh, I'm with the Amphibian Foundation. We're located at the Blue Heron Nature Preserve in uh, Buckhead, Atlanta. And um, just in case you're unfamiliar, here's our mission. We're just uh, a nonprofit. Uh, we're focused on creating lasting solutions to the global amphibian extinction crisis, mostly through connecting partners, individuals, communities, and organizations focused on conserving uh, amphibians. And then just as a quick refresher, just in case amphibians, I'm referring to frogs like this beautiful glass frog here. Uh, salamanders, and this is a palm salamander, and also these Sicilians. If you're unfamiliar, there are a over 200 limbless tropical amphibians that resemble worms and snakes together, and they are the Sicilians, and they are amazing. Um, and so amphibians, as I already alluded to, are, are disappearing, uh, and that is the primary reason why we started the Amphibian Foundation and why we started monitoring am amphibians. Um, this program that I'm talking about today was started in 2014. So we've, we've been spending a lot of time out in Metro Atlanta uh, monitoring amphibian species. Um, so there are 43% of the amphibian species are documented as in decline or already extinct. So that is a huge percentage of amphibians that are in, tr in trouble. They're disappearing globally, not just in developed areas like Atlanta, but also uh, in pristine environments as well. And multiple factors, and I'll, I'll mention a few of them have been uh, identified as the causes for these declines. The last time a group of animals disappeared like this at such a rate, it was the dinosaurs. Okay, so just think about that. It was the last time a group has disappeared uh, this quickly. So, why should we care? It's a question I get a lot. And so, uh, aside from the intrinsic value of protecting all biodiversity, there are some reasons why we want to keep our amphibians around. Usually, the first thing I say to people is that they eat a lot of bugs. Uh, amphibians eat a lot of bugs. So a thousand frogs, for example, eat five million insects a year, okay? Some species, here's a native Metro Atlanta amphibian, the marbled salamander, specializes in eating mosquitoes, 
So they're really doing uh, quite a service for us here. Watch, it's going to eat it here. Uh, aside from eating whatever they can fit in their mouths, mostly bugs, <laughs> amphibians are a vital part of the food chain. So here's a bullfrog in each of these two photos. A uh, bullfrog eating a mouse in one and a bullfrog getting eaten by a heron in the other. Um, that heron shot was right at the Atlanta Botanical Garden too, by the way. So it's uh, very graphic photos, but really showing how frogs or amphibians are, are right in the middle of the food chain and lots of predators are depending on these species. Um, the amphibian skin is very sensitive. Uh, and that makes amphibians a, a vital indicator of the ecosystem's health uh, and balance. Uh, when things are out of balance in the ecosystem, the amphibians respond and they're really the first group to respond. And I should also mention, they are responding. They are responding quite profoundly that there are lots of imbalances uh, and problems in the ecosystems um, worldwide. Um, another way that they're responding are, are with these limb deformities and defects. Um, and, uh, you know, it doesn't take much. Um, chem agricultural chemicals well below EPA acceptable limits are causing these uh, defor deformations in frogs. Um, and so that's cause for great concern as well. One of my favorite things about amphibians is that they have been around a long time. Okay, so hundreds of millions of years. At one point, they looked like these kind of, uh, I don't even know, like a beaver, pit bull, salamander, cross. Um, and, and they've evolved into these three groups I already mentioned, frogs, salamanders, and Sicilians, even before the dinosaurs showed up. So there were frogs hopping around the feet of the dinosaurs. Um, some of the larger frogs even ate baby dinosaurs, which is just a neat thing to know. Amphibians are very useful to human health. Um, and that's uh, another thing I like to point out is that there are compounds in the skin of an amphibian which are more effective than morphine and non-addictive. There are other compounds which can block viral transmission with 100% effectiveness. Uh, a lot of other pharmaceutical properties that this could probably be its own lecture or its own series of lectures, but I at least like to point that out. And then I want to mention that there are a lot of amphibians, okay? Um, it's, it's just difficult to understand that because you basically have to go out a lot on rainy nights to really get an indication of how many amphibians there are out there. But in a healthy ecosystem, the biomass of a single species can exceed that of the mammals and birds combined in a healthy ecosystem. It's just that they're hiding and we don't really know about it. So if you wanna see what a biomass means of amphibians, here is a biomass. This is a migration of tiger salamanders. So they're out there, you know, so 50 weeks of the year, maybe even 51 weeks of the year, you might not even see a single tiger salamander. But if you happen to go out during the migration, you'll see them by the hundreds. They're there, we just don't know about it. And they occur everywhere. So uh, amphibians are everywhere, even in places you would not expect them. So deserts, um, the inside the Arctic Circle, just places you might think are inhospitable to amphibians, they've found a way to get there. Okay, and so I mentioned earlier, there are 43% of the world's amphibians are either extinct or declining. And so I just looked this up this morning. As of today, there are 8,315 known species of amphibians. And if 43% of them are documented as in decline, that's a simultaneous loss of 3,500 species, over 3,500 species currently. And that's just cause for extreme concern. Hmm. 
Um, this is not a, a Metro Atlanta native, but I like to point out some of these highlights here. This is a species, the Panamanian golden frog, which is extinct in the wild. The gastric brooding frog, which uh, has been extinct since 1980. And this is a species where the male would shut down its digestive system and swallow the eggs. And uh, they would develop in the, in the father's stomach and then he would just cough up these baby frogs. Uh, fascinating species. Here's another species which has been extinct since the 1980s. And then the Rab's fringe limb tree frog went extinct in September of 2016. The last known Rab's fringe limb tree frog died here in Atlanta, even though this is a Panamanian species. And this is a, this particular frog is a frog I knew very well and worked with him for about seven years before he died. So uh, he was, thought to be the last known Rab's fringe limb tree frog since 2012 when the second to last Rab's died. And so he'd gotten some media uh, attention in National Geographic and some other things, including this documentary on the extinction crisis called Racing Extinction. It's a great documentary, but you should be in a, try to be in a good mood uh, before you watch it. <laughs> And then this, this article came out in The Guardian, Frog Goes Extinct, Media Yawns. And I just thought that was sad, but also true and powerful. How can the public care about a global mass extinction if they aren't even told about its victims? So um, I just wanna quickly go over some of the main causes for these amphibian declines. Uh, and here's just a term, the extinction debt is a, a way that conservationists uh, think about these things is the future ecological cost um, of present day habitat destruction. So um, the things that are, we are doing, humans are doing to the environments now, we might not see reflected in the amphibian populations or wildlife uh, for a number of years. And the uh, conversely, what we're witnessing now uh, in the amphibian communities are the results of things that happened uh, in, in, the, in the past. Um, and some, some of these things are, are long in the past. You know, it's just what we're witnessing are these amphibians just hanging on and responding to things that we've done to their habitats. So just the main causes, no surprise, habitat alteration, harvest, you know, collecting them from the wild, Exotic species, you know, uh, humans are really good at moving species from one place to the next. And, and a lot of these changes uh, have very negative effects on amphibians. Uh, acidification of the environment, uh, pollution, uh, outdoor pet and feral cats, climbing the list of causes here in the United States with hundreds of millions of amphibians being killed each year by outdoor pet and feral cats. Um, in emergent infectious disease and climate, those are asterisks because those two, um, there's no real clear solution. You know, So uh, there are diseases that humans have inadvertently spread from a place where amphibians are resistant to places where it's novel and the amphibians have no resistance and it's wiping them out. Um, and it's, it's um, very concerning, but there's no clear uh, solution for these two last two. So here in Atlanta, there, there is a lot going on. Uh, it's a great place to get involved with amphibian conservation. Uh, at the foundation, I have highlighted here some of our main initiatives. Our highest priorities are native um, imperiled species like the flatwood salamander, the striped newt, and the gopher frog. But we also do um, this Metro Atlanta amphibian monitoring program that I'm talking with you about today and a number of educational training and outreach programs. I'll at least have a little time to mention them. Um, but this next picture 
wanted to give you a little bit of my background quickly because this is my background. My background is puddles. I am a puddle biologist. Um, I study and specialize in amphibians that use a wetland like this, uh, an ephemeral wetland or a vernal pool or a seasonal pool, these tiny depressions in the woods that collect water for months of the year and are otherwise dry. Um, I've been just really fascinated with the amphibian communities that use these types of wetlands. Um, you'll never find me at the beach you'll find me in a puddle like this, and that's where I'm the happiest. Uh, here I am in one of my first puddles uh, in, in Massachusetts, where I went to uh, college. And then for graduate school, I worked in Everglades National Park, which functioned like a big puddle. And what I mean is that in the area where I worked, it was perfectly dry for part of the year, no water, and perfectly wet for part of the year, no land and it was a fascinating place um to do except for you know the mosquitoes i, I really loved it proof those mosquitoes though so uh that led led us here in atlanta where we were working on some of the most endangered amphibians in the state um we have a page on our website the research page which outlines all of our priorities if you're interested um we started the amphibian foundation four years ago uh focusing on the frosted flatwood salamander uh, my wife and i started the amphibian foundation with the and i'm not kidding the world's only captive colony of this species on the planet was in our basement um and that's how we started. Uh, we're we're um, focusing on figuring out the puzzle of how to produce this species, which is on the brink of extinction in uh, captivity so that we can release lots of healthy baby salamanders into restored habitat. That is the goal of this recovery program that we are a part of. And you can see how beautiful these salamanders are um they used to occur through throughout south carolina uh through georgia and into uh northeastern florida or the and in the panhandle as well um they they are considered gone from south carolina and there's only one wetland left in the state of georgia that has this species still detectable there are two flatwood salamanders bishop eye and cingulatum Sometimes I feel like I can tell them apart, but other times I can't. They're very similar, but they're genetic, genetically distinct. Here are our partners uh, working on this project. Here's one in the wild. Um, so flatwood salamanders have suffered a 90% loss of population since 1999. <laughs> Uh, I just mentioned their historic range, which you can see here. Um, so here's their historic range, and then here is their current range. Okay. Uh, I'll show you that again. <laughs> historic range, current range. And so the dot that you can see in South Carolina, for example, that's the last place that they were detected, Francis Marion national forest but they haven't been found there in over 12 years um, so i'll zoom in so you can see it a little better those two blue dots are the bishop eye the reticulated flat salamander the orange dots are cingulatum the frosted flatwood salamander so here's our team at the last known site in georgia where we monitor this uh, site every year it's on fort stewart Army base in uh, Eastern Georgia. Uh, we're, when we're surveying, we're mostly looking for the larvae. Here's a larvae of a flatwood salamander. They have those kind of bold stripes that helps them blend in with the grass. Here's our flatwood salamander lab with some uh, the salamander interns in here where we rear up 
we've gotten very good at, at hatching out eggs and rearing them up into healthy adults. And so now we're focused on uh, breeding them. Here's some field collected eggs. These eggs right here are from Apalachicola National Forest, where they very carefully collected these eggs. We brought them to the Amphibian Foundation to hatch them out. So here we put, pulled them out very carefully with the spoon, one by one, and uh, hatched them out. Sometimes they hatched right in the spoon, as you can see there. Here's what they look like in the wild. This is just a fantastic Pierce, uh, picture from one of our partners, Pearson Hill. Here's one of our uh, lab reared larvae. Here's a fistful of salamanders getting ready for release. And here's one in the lab that's taking its very first steps. I just thought it was really cute, so I wanted to share it. It was just metamorphosed, so I was learning how to walk. So here's a big, beefy, lab-reared flatwood salamander. See how cute they are? That's why we're working hard to save them. <laughs> Gopher frogs, uh, another Georgia native. Here's the partners we're working on with this. This is Georgia's rarest frog species. Here's a bunch of, of baby gopher frogs getting ready to be released. Here's one that we just released. And it just looked, look, he looks so cute. I wanted to take his picture. Once they metamorphose, they really like to eat each other. So once we have to put them in individual cups, it's not convenient. So here's hundreds of gopher frogs getting ready to be released back out into the wild. Wish they wouldn't eat each other. Um, this is a picture from Georgia DNR. Uh, we've been releasing gopher frogs at a site in southwestern Georgia for 10 years. Uh, and then in 2013, we heard our first gopher frogs calling. So the first evidence that our baby frogs are reaching adulthood, becoming uh, uh, interested in reproduction and calling. And later that same year, they bred. We found an egg mass, which is just a huge, amazing thing and some evidence that what we're doing is finally working, but it took a long time. Here's our captive program for gopher frogs where we're trying to breed them at the Amphibian Foundation. And then I wanted to highlight striped newts as well. This is another extremely imperiled Georgia species. So we breed these and release them. Um, and so here's a bunch of baby newts that are getting ready for release. And uh, these newts get tattooed. So this is the tattoo team, tattoo team from a couple years ago, tattooing these salamanders with uh, recognizable marks so we can tell when they were released um, and how old they are and, and, and um, that type of information. Here's one that we're releasing. We feel really good about that when we're releasing newts. Uh, and then we do some conservation projects here in Metro Atlanta as well. So this is a native species uh, to, to Atlanta or the Georgia Piedmont. This is a spotted salamander. Uh, this is not an imperiled species, but in Atlanta, it's not doing very well. So we've identified some breeding sites for the species and we've been working with partners to restore habitat and return spotted salamanders, uh, start new populations. And so um, we've been able to establish them at two new sites in Metro Atlanta. And this is one of the most beautiful species of salamander, the species I started with. So I have a particular affinity for them. Um, not this March because of coronavirus, but all other marches, we do a salamander stroll at the Clyde Shepherd Nature Preserve as part of the Atlanta Science Festival. 
and um, we find a lot of salamanders if you're interested in joining us ever. And the tiger salamander is another Georgia native that we work with. Mole salamander, this is a Metro Atlanta native. Uh, marbled salamander is another Metro Atlanta native. And then we also work with this non-native uh, ring salamander because it is the closest living relative to the flatwood salamander. Um, and it's another endangered species that we're trying to learn from. And so um, here's the facility that we use to uh, work with these endangered species. These are, we've made little ephemeral wetlands. It's um, 300 gallon tubs. And uh, this is where we have our flatwood salamanders and our gopher frogs and all these species outside year round in these ephemeral wetlands. At first we had 20 of these and we've increased it to 33 and we're gonna be increasing it even further this year. Here's some salamanders getting ready for a release into these artificial wetlands. Told you all that to tell you this. So I wanted to give a little highlight of our Metro Atlanta Amphibian Monitoring Program and uh, also highlight some of the amazing species. So like I said, we've been out monitoring these uh, and amphibian communities in uh, Metro Atlanta since 2014. And, you know, we wanted to see what's going on out there, um, identify some of these ephemeral wetlands or puddles, work with land managers about restoring habitat, habitat find areas where we could connect potential populations, um, and just, you know, get people pumped about amphibians and uh, connect the community with, you know, because we're really lucky. We have 28 species, which, you know, that's not too shabby. Um, so we've been surveying over 120 sites in Metro Atlanta, and that's uh, just a, a lot of sites. And so we have um, some really good data on a, on a number of species, but there are still several historic species that we have yet to detect. I already showed you this, the website, but apparently I was also sharing my calendar. So here's the website again, and the URL is at the top left. Um, this is uh, just a list I made when I first moved to Atlanta. Uh, all the species that occur here, I color coded them by season. And I noticed that um, the uh, there are no autumnal frogs. So I have uh, salamanders at the top and frogs at the bottom. It might be hard for you to read depending on, on your screen, but it, it's not important. It was just highlighting the fact that there are no frogs that typically breed in the fall. And uh, I thought that was interesting. I uh, also, this is where I figured out which habitats which are in as well. And 62% um, of our Atlanta amphibians will use ephemeral wetlands uh, to breed. And 24%, so almost a quarter, will only use ephemeral wetlands. They are obligate ephemeral wetlands breeders, which means that they will not breed in anything else. Um, most of these ephemeral wetland breeders breed in the same wetland that they were born in, okay? So they return to the same puddle each year that they were born in, and that is called site fidelity. Actually, this morning I got reports that uh, two gopher frogs were detected last night um, that were 10, they've been found going back to their birth pond 10 years later. So they were detected last night and they've been detected going back to this same pond for a full decade, which is pretty amazing for a little frog. It's, just, it's got a lot of 
surviving to do to make it 10 years. So here's some of our salamanders. I already told you how amazing I think these spotted salamanders are. and They're glorious. We have these big purple black salamanders with bright yellow spots and they still live here. Um, this is another one of those species that's only active for one, maybe two weeks of the year. Um, what they do is the males come to the ponds and this is the breeding season right now. Um, males come to the ponds in what is called a congress, group of male salamanders is a congress, and they lay these spermatophores and I have an arrow pointing at a spermatophore right there. Here's a close-up of a spermatophore. The males lay them on the bottoms of the ponds and then the females come and pick them up. So the, you can see there's a spermatophore on the right and on the left is just the stalk of what was attaching the spermatophore to that grass. It's been picked up by the female spotted salamander. Once the eggs are fertilized, they are laid in a pretty large mass that is uh, tight at first, and as it absorbs water and develops, it gets larger. These uh, embryos develop and they have uh, a symbiosis with algae. The larvae do. So the algae penetrate the eggs and provide oxygen while feeding on the waste from the developing salamander. So here are some relative spotted salamander and relatives of the spotted salamander that live here in the Georgia Piedmont, the marbled salamander below and the mole salamander on the right. We have not detected any mole salamanders through our surveys yet, so, uh, but we're staying optimistic. Um, I think it was now two years ago, we, we found our first uh, population of marbled salamanders still inside of the perimeter of Atlanta. Uh, marble salamanders breed terrestrially. So those BBs are actually eggs. They lay their eggs on dry land and they wait for the rain to fill the ephemeral wetland. And once the eggs get inundated with water, the salamander, the adults leave and the eggs hatch. It's a, a fascinating strategy. Uh, there's another group of salamanders which don't even have lungs. The lungless salamanders are the family of Plethodonidae. And these are some of the most common amphibians you might find in this area, particularly the redback on the top left and the slimy salamander on the top right. If you've ever, ever handled a slimy salamander for more than one second, you will know why they are called the slimy salamander. They have a defense mechanism where they'll secrete this slime on you and it's not easy to get off. Uh, it's not harmful. Um, it's noxious. It's mostly meant for predators. If you bite one of these things, you're going to get a mouthful of disgusting slime, which, you know, sounds very effective. Um, and we also have the mud salamander and the red salamander. Um, the and here are some more of our lungless salamanders, the dusky, the seal, the two-lined, and the three-lined. Just got to count the lines to tell those two apart. Um, and then we also have uh, the spring salamander and the four-toed. They're uh, both very fascinating species. And then we have these newts, a uh, different family altogether, the family salamandridae. Um, and they, we have these newts, which we're not finding very much of inside the perimeter. I'm certain that they were here, uh, but they just don't seem to be doing very well. Um, and they metamorphose twice. So they have a very fascinating uh, natural history where the larvae metamorphose into these juvenile Fs, these bright orange, highly toxic diurnal monsters that, that march around like they own the forest. Uh, because everything's learned not to eat them. And then they metamorphose uh, again to become an aquatic adult, the, the spotted newt. And then on our frogs, the, um, 
this is uh, if you wanted to learn how to tell your tadpoles apart, here's a quick way to do that. Um, and that's by looking top down on your larvae like this. If the eyes are on the top of the head, um, then that in, in this area, at least, this will only work around here. If the eyes are on the top of the head, this is a true frog, meaning a bullfrog or a green frog or a pickerel frog or a leopard frog. If you're looking top down on the larvae and the eyes are on the sides, then that is a tree frog. Um, if you're looking and you see external gills in forelimbs, the arms, that is a salamander. And if your tadpole is small and glossy black, um, it's probably a toad, especially if you see it in groups with lots and lots of other shiny black tadpoles because usually when you see one toad tadpole you see a lot of them so there you go quick way to get get through your tadpoles if you're curious um, true frogs also lay their eggs in clumps or mats so if you see a big clump or mat of eggs um, that'll be a true frog here are some of our true frogs here the ones I just listed, we have a bullfrog on top left, green frog on the top right. Um, you're going to want to pay attention to that ridge that comes down behind the eye. That's, for me, the easiest way to tell a green frog from a bullfrog. Green frogs have that prominent ridge that comes down from the eye and goes towards the groin. Uh, and then the pickerel frogs and the leopard frogs on the bottom. Um, see, we're getting short on time because I, I really do like to talk about frogs. So let me see about this. Okay, here. Um, just want to show some of our amazing tree frogs we have around here. The gray tree frog, the green tree frog, and our bird boy's frog. There's a baby gray tree frog on the top right on a pencil. So tiny. Other tree frogs we have around here are the peeper, the chorus frog, and the cricket frog. And then our toads. So the toads, we have two species of true toad here. Um, and so we have the American toad and the fowler's toad. America, uh, toads lay their eggs in strands. So if you see eggs laid in strands like you see here, those are toad eggs. And if you want to tell your fowler's toad from your American toad, the easiest way is to count your warts per spot. Okay. You get down there, you look at the largest spot on the toad's back and see how many warts there are. They're not really warts, but see how many you see in the largest spots. Fowler's toads have more than two. American toads have less than three. And then our, uh, these are common named toads. These are not true toads uh, in the family Bufonidae, which is the family of true toads. These are uh, frogs with the common name toad, which is a little confusing, but we have our narrow mouth toad and our spade foot toad. And um, they are both hilarious in their behavior and also in their call where their narrow mouth toad sounds like a very sad sheep calling in the middle of the night and a spade foot toad i can't describe it but it sounds a little bit like <laughs> something like that along those lines i've tried to uh perfect my spade foot toad call but i'm i'm not quite there yet uh, i think that is all I, those are all our amphibians and I see that we're running a little low on time. So I thought I'd open it up and see if we have questions. Awesome. Thank you so much, Mark. That was amazing. All those photos are amazing and all the info. Every time I look at one, I'm like, wow, I really wish I knew something more about this animal. And now I feel like I do. I can take that with me. Thank you. Great. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Does anyone have any questions for Mark? I, th I think Javi's starting. Javi, you can feel free to unmute if it's easier than typing in the chat as well. 
Hey, how are you doing, Mark? Excellent presentation. Thank you so very much for sharing all that great information. Um, Thank you. I, uh, have you been involved with uh, amphibians and in, in cave environments by any chance? Um, a little bit. So we this year started a project for the Pigeon Mountain Salamander in Northwest Georgia. Uh, and so, you know, a little bit of caving there um, because they're found in Petty John. But uh, I personally am, I don't have the right personality type for stuffing myself into rock crevices. Uh, but I know people that do. And, and you know, the, the amphibians that use these caves are, are, are not doing well. So it's important work, um, but it's definitely not for me. Petty John Cave is nice and spacious when you get in there, so it's possible for me to feel okay. But uh, do you spend time in caves? Yeah, I used to cave a lot uh, anywhere between Tennessee and Georgia. And I remember some of the caves in Tennessee just being it's just a carpet of salamanders in the early 2000s. And then a few years, you know, after that, it came back and it wasn't, it wasn't the same amount. So Petty Jones, of course, is a no. very well-traveled, trashy cave. <laughs> but there are Absolutely. all cases the mountain that you can, you know, same thing, same concept. Uh, Cloudland Canyon has a couple that you can just basically walk into it. No, no tight spots that you can also see uh, uh, some, some of the, some salamanders. In Alabama, uh -huh. you will see, you know, some of the pristine areas in Alabama, you will see uh, not just uh, awesome amphibians, but also I have a chance to see a blind fish there too. Oh, wow. Great. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you. Thank I you. appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we do have some other questions in the chat. Sharon says she recently found some dusky eggs in the stream she just started monitoring and would also love to be able to monitor those eggs as well. Do you have any advice for her? Um, uh, well, I mean, the monitoring eggs, uh, we, we generally just record when we find eggs as far as like what we ask of our monitors, uh, but we don't, well, we just don't have the capacity to return and check on the same egg mass repeatedly to, to make sure that it's developing well. But um, a lot of the duskies, even here in Metro Atlanta, seem to be doing okay. I found duskies in some really horrible streams. Um, so I don't know what it is about them, but they're, uh, them and two-line salamanders just seem to be more tolerant than, than other things. I think she clarified, she said no monitoring the adults. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, our the way we monitor is a little bit different than some other programs is that we train our uh, community scientists to properly identify um, amphibians, just like the now retired NAMP, the North American Amphibian Monitoring Program, which was uh, the USGS program. Um, you know, so that people can properly identify their amphibians and then you have to pass a quiz, an annual quiz to submit your data. And then they just return to the site once a month. So we ask our monitors to go to their site for one hour a month, uh, 12 months of the year though. Awesome, thank you. Um, sure. So you kind of already spoke a little bit to that. Um, of I don't, don't want to interrupt anyone. If I am, please tell me. But I know you kind of already spoke to that, but Betty's asking what opportunities do you offer for people who want to learn more? Uh, well, um, thanks, Betty. Um, you know, I'll have to preface this with like pre and now, you know, post COVID. Um, but, you know, in the non COVID times, we would give seasonal workshops, free amphibian workshops for people that wanted to learn about um, these amphibians. And it's, it's, it's basically like a slowed down version of what I did today with a lot more information, but also some live animals. So we kind of use these free workshops um, as a way to get people pumped about amphibians, but also try to recruit them into the monitoring uh, because we encourage people to monitor amphibians that are either in their yard 
or in their neighborhood park or just somewhere real close, you know, uh, I think that's important. Uh, and it's also not like cell phone based, like um, we really want to train people properly and have them do their own identifications rather than like uh, take a picture and upload it to iNaturalist. That's important stuff too, but that's just not really what this program's about. Um, and then on our website, uh, we have lots of other ways that people can get involved depending on how much time they have to commit to it. So thank you. Great, thanks. And I see um, Brandy has her hand raised. So if you wanna go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question. Or you can put it in the chat. <laughs> Yeah, I think we did have um, another question though while we wait for Brandy. So Sabrina uh, was wondering, what's the process you use for tattooing the salamanders and how did you decide on that? Um, yeah, so when you're releasing amphibian to the wild and monitoring them, which is super important, you know, so we produce animals, we release them into the wild, but you know, we have to follow up to make sure they're, they're doing okay and uh, make sure it's part of a, a more comprehensive program. We, we need to be able to tell if, we've, if they're animals that we've released or not. So that's tricky. So it involves, when I first started, the convention was to cut off one or two toes. So we were releasing eight and nine toed amphibians and I, I, you know, I've never liked that. Uh, and um, if you're doing a lot of amphibians, you end up with a, a lot of toes, you know, and then and it's kind of morbid. So then uh, over the last few years, we've switched to some other ways. Uh, in VIE, visual implant elastomer is the tattoo. And you can tattoo them with just little dots. Does not seem to cause a lot of distress for the animals. And then the dots, um, you can actually reflect them with the UV light. Um, and so you can, you can get a lot of information if you're using like one or two or three different colored dots. Uh, and so that's a pretty, uh, well used cause it's low cost, not very stressful on the animals technique that, that, uh, lasts. So you can see that year after year. Um, there are other ways that you can, you can surgically implant, uh, a, a little tag that'll, you know, you can scan your amphibians. That's if you have a lot of money, which conservation programs usually generally don't. But these are all the different things. We've, we've put little backpacks on gopher frogs. That's <laughs> expensive, but it's also hilarious and fun. And so you can follow gopher frogs for a week or two, and then the batteries run out, and you got to you know, get your backpack back. Um, and so <laughs> there's, there's different things depending on how much money you have. But this VIE, these tattoos are super effective uh, and, and seem to last. Hey, thank you. Um, and I had a, oh, sure. sorry, Jack, did you have a question? Well, I was just gonna say this. If you've ever never been to one of Mark's workshops at Confluence, I'm hoping we'll all, we're all hoping we'll get live next year, but there's never, never seen a more rapt audience or Aww. a staff more dedicated to trying to implement protecting their salamanders when they're invited to come forward and look at them. There's usually a mass storming of the stage interrupted by yeah. Mark and his staff, putting some of them off limits, but it's a fantastic workshop. I really hugely recommend it. Hey, Mark, I have one quick qu uh, question you. for you. Are your tanks at yeah. Blue Heron what you do your breeding? Is that what you do? Uh, yeah, that's where we, you know, the, the large outdoor uh, tanks, yeah. is that what you're talking yeah. about? Yeah, yeah, they're yeah. all, they're at Blue Heron and, you know, it's, it's a city park, so people can come and check them out anytime. And are you worried about what's going on up at Emma Lane? I heard there was some development. This isn't exactly on topic, but it is if it threatens the numerous vernal pools and other wetlands up at Emma. Do you know what's going on up there? Is there anything to worry about up there? I was unaware, so you might know something I don't. I'll send you something offline then. Anyway, I'm thanks. Okay. Sorry, Cecilia. Thank you. Well, no, no problem. Thank you very much. Oh, absolutely. Thanks, Jack. Um, 
Mm -hmm. Well, Anne has a question. Uh, she wants to know what size are the tattoos? They're smaller than a pinhead. So they're, they're small. Fundraised by offering people, getting people to sponsor backpacks on frogs. That's that's <laughs> that's irresistible. That's completely irresistible. We we get a lot of information from those backpacks. Unfortunately, some of it's bad. Like uh, we found a backpack in Snake Pool Lot, uh, for example. So, but at least you you know we know we know what happened to that frog, and that's probably what happens to you know a lot of the frogs. Right. I had a I had a question um, when you were talking yeah. about how some of the um, the I believe it was frogs or maybe both um, frogs and, and salamanders were finding their way back to their home ponds essentially. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if there's been any research done on kind of how that works because I know with like salmon they have like the olfactory navigation and stuff like that. So I wasn't sure if that's been studied at all. Yeah, well. Thank you for that question, because uh, I think what, the, what I mentioned it the most with today was the gopher frog for turning out 10 years, you know, and it's super mysterious. So um, you know, a lot of amphibians we detect at the breeding site and we can tell, uh, recognize them year after year. But really what they do in between breeding seasons has remained largely a mystery. Um, the flatwood salamanders we focus on have the same natural history where they disappear for 51 weeks a year and nobody knows what they do. They own, we have guesses, but we have no idea. So it's really, there's a lot of uh, mystery out there still. And we're trying to, trying to find out because, you know, for, from a conservation standpoint, we have to conserve the wetland where they breed, but also the upland and where they go, how far do they go? You know, these are questions that we're just trying to figure out. Thank you for that. Thanks, Mark. We do have a couple more here. I know we're right at one o'clock, but if you're fine, then we're fine. I'm, I'm totally fine. I'm having a great time. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah. Well, you have a couple more. <laughs> Melanie wants to know, uh, she says, just to clarify, did you say the only remaining habitat for flatwood salamanders is in Fort Stewart? Um, well, it depends. The, the only habitat in Georgia is at Fort Stewart. That's the only place. There are still two clusters of sites in the Florida panhandle where you can still find them, uh, Apalachicola and St. Mark's. Uh, St. Mark's, though, their breeding sites were hit directly by Hurricane Michael and completely inundated with the ocean uh, a couple of years ago. So, you know, th this, is a, this is a species right on, on the brink. Thanks. Um, we have a question mm -hmm. from Ruth. Um, she said, would that influence your relocation efforts? And Ruth, I don't know if you want to clarify or... Because um, I think we may have moved on from from what that question <laughs> had to, and I can I can just say it. Um, I was thinking about the olfactory um, stuff that you were talking about, and when you were mentioning collecting eggs and raising, and then releasing those eggs for certain salamanders, I did I wasn't sure if you were releasing them in the same area or if they were getting released in new areas to populate new spots. And I wondered if that olfactory going back well, to their birthplace well, would make a difference. Sure. And, and you know, we, we can guess that olfactory plays a part, but we're not even sure about that. Because sometimes it seems like the salamanders are visually getting their bearing, which just really blows my mind. How well can they see? So the, the, can, the thought is that these animals are imprinting on their natal wetland at metamorphosis. And so we have been proceeding as if that is the case. And it really seems like that is true. So we are releasing animals when we release them as late stage larvae so that they can metamorphose where we want them to establish. And so far it's been very promising. They are returning to their natal ponds. Uh, to breed their, uh, their natal ponds to breed. And so there's another conservation program in California 
where they inadvertently allowed the animals to metamorphose in their outdoor tubs and then took them as young terrestrial salamanders to the conservation site. And these animals found their way back to the tubs. They had associated the tubs with their natal wetlands. So that was unfortunate, but also some pretty strong evidence that somehow they're imprinting at that crucial stage. Does that answer your question? She said, that's yes, amazing. That was awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, sure. You're welcome. Yeah, really interesting. Thank you. Um, <laughs> just a couple more questions. I think, um, well, actually, that one is also from Ruth. So I think that that was part of the question. Um, oh, OK. So I think that'll probably wrap us up. Oh, OK. Okay. It's great chatting questions? with you all. Sorry, Bailey. I don't know if you have one. <laughs> no, it's okay. I can always email and ask some more questions later. So that's totally fine. No. We're trying to, we're trying to scoot go up. ahead. <laughs> okay, mine can, be, mine can be quick. I, um, when I was in school, I took a mycology class. We learned about, you know, chytrids and how they are, have been really detrimental to amphibians. And I just didn't know if you're experiencing any of that here or like, you know, what you've heard about that, because I haven't really, you know, had any experience with it since a few years ago. Since um, sure, uh, absolutely. So <clears throat> when I moved to Atlanta, it was to work at the Botanical Garden, and the conservation program there at the time was focused on Panamanian species that were really wiped out from a chytrid fungus infection of central Panama. Okay, so that, that's I knew uh, intellectually about chytrid, but I hadn't experienced conservation programs that were revolving around chytrid uh, until then. And it's pretty terrifying. I had seen other disease outbreaks um, here in the United States, not chytrid, but some viruses that have wiped out amphibians. Chytrid is pretty terrifying. Um, and so we, uh, for the collection there, we were uh, monitoring the amphibians for chytrid and we began doing some routine surveillance on wild native amphibians. And we were getting a lot of positives. So um, now we've been doing it for a number of years and the frogs around here, a lot of them have chytrid and they seem to be fine with it. It doesn't seem to give them any detrimental effects other than they are acting as reservoirs where they're just kind of keeping chytrid alive in the environment so that's also kind of troubling but um so it's here it doesn't seem to be causing a problem now that's the original chytrid which is called bd there's also b sal which is a new uh chytrid that's been detected in europe devastating to salamanders uh so we um on the b sal task force for um for the united states where we are uh trying to uh, prepare ourselves for its inevitable arrival here in the salamander biodiversity hotspot of the world, we have to be ready to protect our salamanders. Wow. Thank you so much. That's um, sure. I mean, absolutely devastating and sad, but so interesting as well, like thinking about how they're just holding it and they're like, no, we're fine. <laughs> yeah. Like, I mean, I know the, those new ones are usually really devastating, but we can always hope. So thank you. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> thank you, sure. thank you. Sure. Um, yeah, you have so many comments in here. Your presentation was amazing. Thank you all. Oh, so much. thank you. Um, yeah, we really enjoyed it. We appreciate you taking the time to be with us today. Run a little bit over. Um, <laughs> Yeah, thank you so much. And thanks for inviting me. And thank you for the great questions. This was a lot of fun. Yeah.